Is there anything about the reboot that you hope when they, they do make the movie that you say that like, I hope they don't change this one thing that I contributed? Hi, this is Russell Mulcahy, uh, the director of the 1986 Highlander, and this is Highlander Rewatched. Welcome to the Highlander Rewatch Podcast. I'm one of your rewatchers. I'm Keith. This is Kyle. Unfortunately, Eamon can't be with us this week, but it's his loss because this one is for the record books. That's right. Welcome to a very special Chronicle episode where we talk to the people who have made the Highlander franchise come to life over the past 35 years. Uh, today, we're excited to welcome to our show the individual who brought to the screen Highlander the motion picture, director Russell Mulcahy. Not only is Russell responsible for creating much of the visual and storytelling language that we associate with Highlander, but also is responsible for helping launch the medium of music videos and directed what is considered to be the very first modern music video in 1979 video killed the radio star by the bungles kyle we've seen a number of russell's films uh do you remember what she saw first or do you have a favorite let's talk about russell's movies i i mean for me it was either seeing the highlander the first highlander film or it was seeing the alec baldwin film the shadow the shadow were the, were the first ones that ever i saw Excellent. Yeah, The Shadow was probably the first uh, movie of Russell's I had seen. And it's funny, I have, a, I have a funny story about it. I remember, I think that movie came out in 1994. I was about in third grade or so, uh, I think. Uh, and I went with my friend to the movie with his sister and one of her friends. And they, for whatever reason, wouldn't tell us what movie we were going to see. It was a secret? The it was Shadow like a secret. secret. They were like, well, we got some money, like some spending money. And like, I don't know, where his mom gave us money to go to the movies. And they were like, let's go to the movies. I had no idea where we we're going. We show up and I look at the marquee above the box office and I see the shadow is there. I'm like, yes, we're going to go see the shadow. This is great. And then they ordered the tickets and they were like, four tickets for angels in the outfield, please. <laughs> and I was so, so disappointed. Granted, Angels in the Outfit is a, a fun movie, I guess. Well, I haven't seen that since sick, I was a kid, but. Dick burn on Danny Glover. But yeah, sure. Uh, and Christopher Lloyd. Um, but anyway, <laughs> about, I, I want to say maybe two weeks later, I think I saw The Shadow in the theater with my grandmother, which was really fun. Uh, so I did eventually get to see it in the movies, which was great. Uh, but oh boy, the disappointment I had when I couldn't see it like that opening weekend or whatever. Ooh, palpable. Yeah, I, I, I believe it. And, you know, frankly, how often do you think we say on this pod, this very podcast, who knows? The shadow, the shadow knows. knows. I feel like that happens like every third episode <laughs> right. or so something like that will come up. That sure. might be an exaggeration, but not by much. Sure. And we've so. seen some other movies of Russell's. Uh, we actually reviewed on this show as one of our mini episodes. We did Razorback, which I think is from 1984. Uh and what do we think and of that movie? Back horror vegetarian allegory that is Razorback. Tell him it's certainly a finish the kangaroo off. Certainly. It's uh, I was surprised at how much fun the movie is. The like the costumes are crazy. The performances are great. Like Kyle, how much how might you sum up or or try to describe what Russell's like filmmaking style is? Like there's something special and uniquely visual about it. I think. I mean, every, things move in a way that looks m far more modern than it is. Mm -hmm. It's like there's far more cuts than the things of the day. And like, there's a lot of really striking visuals that seem to just exist for their own sake in many cases. his movies and maybe we'll get into this a little tend to, to be a little symbol rich yeah they are and and some of that i think is uh infused in some of the the choices he makes um in terms of what 
shotsy highlights and what the kind of showcase shots in a given scene might be. Yeah, there's definitely a through line. I think if you look at Russell's work, you can trace a line to like the Marvel and DC cinematic universe today, I think. Like comic book movies didn't exist quite in the same way until we started getting things like Russell's directing style, Tim Burton, like really visual, uh, colorful movies, I think. Like The Shadow is a great example of like incredible comic book matte paintings and like just exciting shots. Uh, it's it's really great. Uh, you, like, you can see where Sam Raimi would have like gotten a lot of his flair from a director like Russell Mulcahy, uh, which is cool. So I think we have like a lot in pop culture to be thankful for. Uh, not to mention like dozens of music videos, you know, uh, which like has shaped the musical landscape of today, which is pretty cool. Yeah, Duran Duran, want to know your location. Just like that, river twisting through a dusty lane. Uh, right. It's, you know, it's pretty exciting seeing the, and you can really see the connection between that music video work and like the frantic energy that they bring of trying to tell a story and you know, 305 or whatever you're trying to do and how that translates into some of these fast paced uh, scenes and shots you, you see from these films. It's pretty exciting. I'm very excited to talk to him about it. Definitely. Yeah, I can't wait either. Uh, so Russell's career has spanned over 40 years, leading him to work with some of the greatest musical acts in the world. And he's directed everything from like gritty action movies to emotional TV dramas to supernatural teen fantasy shows. Uh, so we're thrilled to have him. Please join us in welcoming to the show Highlander director, Russell Mulcahy. Welcome, Russell. Hi, Kate. How are you? Great. It's great to hear your voice. Uh, so I'm joined by my co-host, Kyle, right now. He's on the phone. Hi, how are you, Russell? Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Very excited you could join us here today. It's now the 35th anniversary of 1986's Highlander. Uh, and it's it's an amazing film, and it's incredible that every year we keep celebrating uh, its history. And what does it mean to you, Russell, that like Highlander has persisted all these now decades, which is which is incredible. What's that mean to you, that it's achieved cult status? It's very nice. It's, it's, um, uh, no one ever saw that coming. But um, I guess when we made the film, we always knew it it was something special. There was something uh, innately original and exciting about the story and, and the way we were shooting it. You know, as we all know, it had um, rather a lackluster uh, US opening. I thought Highlander was a completely, and thank you for laughing at that story, completely silly and very boring movie. I kept hoping for something interesting to come along and interrupt those endless sword fights. Bah! And it didn't really pick up speed until it reached Europe. And I remember going to the French premiere with Queen and everyone, and it was just amazing. The the, the energy and the uh, uh, excitement in the cinema that night was. You went, hang on, okay, how come how come they didn't see that in the U.S.? But eventually, sort of all it all came around the, the circle of life, so to speak. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess more people gave it a second chance and said, hang on, let's watch this again. Yeah, so what was oh, it good, you think that the, the European audience got about this movie that maybe the American audience wasn't picking up on? Well, it, it, could, be as, it could be as simple as simple as the European version is longer. Um, it's got a, a, few, a few scenes in there that were not in the American version. The American version, these scenes were cut out. And to me, they were crucial scenes. They were scenes that explain characters and and uh, uh, yeah, um, so like the World War II scene, for example. What am I supposed to say? Hmm? <laughs> Tell them I'm immortal. Uh, explains um, the lady, the woman, the, 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 you know, that he saved in World War II. And so you, in the American version, you wonder why they're so intimate, but not intimate. It's like very strange. Don't be afraid. What's your name? Right, chill. Absolutely perverse. <laughs> Without knowing <laughs> right. the real context of the story. Yeah, it's just a, a tale about Christophe Lambert and his old lady best friend. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. His handbag. 
<laughs> <laughs> and it's not it's not often you see filmmakers go back into a movie to like include new footage uh that really like elevates the story i think which is pretty cool a lot of, a lot of that's to thank is uh you know um people like patrick washburg and uh, the people who believed in the film and uh uh a number of people and, and said no hang on we've, we've got to like bring the real version to like restore the film basically now, speaking of like the vision of the film, I, I think it's pretty incredible that before, now 35 years later, there's all this Highlander that has exist, existed through the films, the television show, there's been all these other things, comics and stuff. Uh, but sure, like you, sure. you, ca you came up with like the original language for Highlanders, things that people today might take for granted that like no one knew what a quickening was until you decided to film it, which is awesome. Uh, so what was the process like to develop like the visual language of what Highlander would be? and who did you discuss these things with? Was it with the writers or the actors, the producers? Uh, let us know your thoughts. I guess the concept of the thick, the quickening is that um, I always thought I always thought it to be powerful and unusual and surreal, but powerful in fact that, that where it can like in the car park, it can the energy can flip a hud cap off a wheel, and later on it can explode all these windows and and hub, um, drainage pipes and. and and it also levitate bodies. And so it had this sort of cosmic energy about it. Um, and then as far as the visualization of it, uh, and this is, there's no CG in this film, it's, it's cell animation. Um, and a, an a animator I knew very closely from the, from the music video days and, and from my company, MGMM, there was a guy that worked there called Matt Forrest. And I got together with him and I showed him some footage and we came up with this whole concept when Christoph um, finally gets the prize and he's lifted off the ground. Um, and we just did this thing. We had come up with this whole idea of these animated sort of spirits and creatures and whatever. And it was, it was sort of pretty wild. It was a lot of fun. But it's also classic Disney-esque -esque, uh, cell animation. Right. I love that style. It gives such like a unique... Uh... You know, aesthetic. Yeah, it's definitely got an organic quality about right. it. Yeah, and, and it holds I up. Think a lot it's also very I think it's also, also very organic. The fact that this is pre CG, uh, it's, uh, it's still organic. That you can still see the wires pulling Kristoff off the ground. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, and no one to this day has like gone back in and said, "Yeah, should we just wipe, get rid of the wires?" And probably, I think some people say, "No, nah, the wires are charming. Leave them in." Right. <laughs> Yeah, that would be like too much of a George Lucas kind of move to go back and <laughs> and exactly, <re> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, when you first started working on on the film, we understand that Christopher Lambert actually didn't speak much English when when the project actually started. Uh, so right. was that shocking to you when uh, when you actually went to shoot? Was there like a strategy to deal with it, or uh, well, did you go yeah. ahead? Well, the thing is, I remember sitting in the office with um, Peter Davis and Bill Panzer um, in the, um, uh, the studio office, and um, we're going, like, who the hell's going to play Highlander? Who's going to play Highlander? And I'm flipping through his magazine, and I remember very distinct, and also I opened it up, and there's a picture of Christoph from Greystoke in, dressed in a suit. Um, and I, he had these eyes which you just sort of screamed at me and pierced into my psyche. And it's like, I went, guys, I think we found him. I mean, and they went, oh my God. And it was like, nah, but he can't speak English. Mm. Mm. But he was so perfect. Do you think about your look? You build your look? Or uh, it just comes out? You know? No, I never shaved, never. Since I was 18 or something. Uh, because because it bores me. I don't like to, don't like to shave. Uh, I shave once a week. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I don't shave at all. And we met with him, and he was so in enthusiastic. And you know, we we had a dialect coach, dialect coach every single day, and he he grabbed onto English real quick. It was amazing, uh, and and I think the whole sort of broken English. Frenchy accent y thing, whatever that goes on. Uh, he does say in the in the cop stage, he says, where, where are you from, Nash? And he says, Lots of different places. Um, so I mean you can you can get away with uh any di you know, any accent dialect, you know. 
He was, he was just he was just perfect. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, the test a weird theory we had because you mentioned mentioned the name Nash. Uh, I understand the yeah. character originally had a different name. I think it was like Richard Talpin or something like that, and it came to be known as Russell Nash. Was that named after you in any way, or is that just a coincidence? I think that's, I think that's a coincidence. Oh um, wow, that's very yeah. funny. Well, that's yeah, too- I mean, Ru- Russell's not Russell's not a hugely common name, for a first name. Uh, so I, I don't know. I think I think it is a coincidence. Nah, it's, it's I, you'll have to ask, I have to ask Peter Bellwood and um, Larry Ferguson that one. Sure. <laughs> so, because I don't think he was named. I, I forget what he was named in Greg Wyden's original script. His the original script was called what Dark Knight, and basically, yeah, that, that, that referring to the Kurgan. Um, and then the script was purchased from Greg, uh, who wrote it as a thesis for his film school, um, and obviously got an A plus. <laughs> and <laughs> so, and then uh, these brilliant writers, Larry Ferguson and Peter Bellwood, came in, and we just had a absolute joy working together and uh yeah it was great did you know the writers ahead of time how did you get connected to no I, no I didn't no I didn't oh, okay no um it, it, it was generally along the, the whole thing with the with the crew of this film uh, from Jerry Fisher to Alan Cameron the production designer James Atchison the costume designer uh Michael Kamen the composer uh never worked never met them never worked with them and we and somehow this magic team just came together that's great. That's Very the magic lucky. of movies, yeah. Yeah, when, when all the chemistry and all the all the parts all work together, so therefore the machine just hums and rolls along. Was it a big shock for you going from music videos to the the, the medium of film? Like, was the 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 daunting size of the well, production did, or anything? This, well, this is my second film. Um, right. My first my first film was Razorback, uh, um, and that, again that one. It wasn't that scary. Well, actually, I think the, the night before the, the, sh- the shoot on Razorback, I didn't sleep, and I went to a location in Broken Hill and sat in a, a sand dune like two hours before the sun came up. So sort of going, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> and yeah, but luckily I was surrounded by you know like Dean Semler, the DP, and uh, people like that, who and Hal Macro, the producer, um, who were just so supportive. And uh, yeah, it was once once you get over the first day. Uh, butterflies um it's it, you just roll with it and and, and have fun awesome. work, and work your bollocks off you know one of the things that really sets climate apart and it seems like people were almost confused by it at the time were kind of the number of fast-paced cuts and you know the the amount of of fast-paced transitions that you end up seeing in the in the movie. How influential was that music video background and bringing that uh, prob- highlight? Probably, probably very uh, influential. I mean, uh, I mean that's music videos were my film school, and in those I, I, I experimented and tried things, and some things were fantastic, and some things fell flat, flat on their ass. So it was really it was my training ground, and 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 obviously a lot of that techniques and style um, are, are part of me as a filmmaker from that.
so yes, there are fast cuts and the transitions are meant to be uh, evocative and, uh, and, and, and surprising. Um, and I remember some of the great joys of making this movie was in the editing process with Peter Honess, wonderful editor who, who just finished Brazil, Terry Gilliam's Brazil. And then he came on to do Highlander. And um, I remember there were, like for example, the transition between the fish tank to them on the rowing on the lake in the boat. Mm-hmm. And I, I was at home and at like seven o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, he rang me and said, Russell, you've got to come in. We've just got the transition in. The, the two bits of film had been put together in the lab. So one shot was basically um, a mirror lens dipped into the, the lock in Scotland and then tilting up um, slowly, revealing Sean and Christoph in the boat. And the other shot is a, a sort of a jib up um, a fish tank. So then the two bits of footage, and we, no one really knew if it was going to work or not. Um, and I came in and he rolled it and it was like, it's one of the, the real highlights of, and a number of other transitions too, but uh, the, to see these transitions come together without being that, like these days you would see a video monitor with uh, tapes and, and this and that, and, and it would just be button pressing and it would all work. But this was sending two bits of footage off to a lab with some Chinograph marks on it, saying, you know, this is uh, and his fingers crossed. And it was like, luckily the water's black enough under the, black and cold enough, so when we chilled it up, it was a perfect mat line. Uh, and everyone was quite surprised by that. So there were surprises all the way along this show, um, in the filming of this. Uh, for example, again, this is Alan Cameron, the production designer, a genius. Um, Two, two, two examples. Um, one is the uh, the forge, you know, the, where he lived in in old Scotland. Uh, that tower, that rock tower thing, the Kurgan and Connery fight up the staircase. Mm-hmm. Uh, that again, we put we filmed it in an old um, iron factory, a big room, and then we hung a psych and we painted the psych with these sort of very sort of 1930s, 40s clouds painted on very theatrical painting on the on the psych of the of the stormy black and white and grey sky. But when the when the walls start collapsing, they're just basically part, part, you know, styrofoam, and every every stone has a bit of fishing line on it. So when <laughs> it was as simple as like a pantomime, you know. So they go strike, strike, strike. And then one, two, three, and all that, like four, 13 guys would pull their fish, their individual fishing lines, and the whole, and there was dust in between the rocks and whatever, and then, and then the wall collapsed. And it looks, you had a sound effect of that, and spectacular. The, the, a lot of the film was very using theatrical techniques, you know, because I worked in theater a lot too, and so I, I love theatrical techniques. Oh, I didn't know you worked in theater. That's really interesting. And you're right about sometimes those simple techniques, you know, uh, are worth it, right? Like they, they, they give you more bang for your buck sometimes than all the, the bells and whistles. They do. They're very clever. I mean, and again, one other, I'll just, just quickly, the one other example of, of that ingenuity of it's very simple is the silver cup sign. And again, the silver cup sign was built uh, and only one third of that sign is metal. Um, and so where, where, where um, the girl is tied up and they, they fight up there on the left-hand side of the, of the sign, that part is metal. The rest of it is basically plastic hmm. and held up, held up by wires. And then the letters of Silver Cup, they're metal and they're hanging by their own individual wires as well. So when the sign collapses uh, and all the letters start falling, Again, there's 20 guys up top. And first, the, the water tank tips over, splash. The stunt guys are fighting away, and the letters start dropping. That's a guy cutting, cutting the wire so the letter would drop. The trick there was that the, the, it was neon dropping into water, which is not great. <laughs> right. So what was so clever about, what's so clever about it is that it was worked out that the, the letter would drop, and before it hit the water, it would unplug itself. Oh. Um, and so it was just, and it would land in the water with no electrical problem. Uh, and then the 
rest of the sign with the plastic part of the scaffolding, which is plastic, again has on wires, and they are individually cut, snap, 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 snap. So we had 14, I think 14 cameras, a tool day to set it up, with 14 cameras, and it's hard when a lot of them are shooting high speed, you're terrified because it's, is it going, is it going camera A running, B camera, C running, you go, oh my God, A's running at high speed, damn almighty. Um, so all the cameras rolling said, okay, one, two, three, go. And it was extraordinary. It all happened in 30 seconds and and we all went home for the weekend. <laughs> so all, all, everyone cut the wires at the right time. Once the stunt guy, one letter nearly hit the stunt guy, but it was all safe. And uh, yeah, it was um, it, it's just one of those things where the whole, all the crew and everyone just break out to a huge applause. It's a great, good feeling. That's awesome. And yeah, also, sure. one of your yeah. your uh, one of your hallmarks seems to also be like in these big special effects moments that you know maybe only take a few seconds to set off. Uh, but you set up your cameras to get coverage on everything, uh, which is cool because you can elongate these like explosions into a minute long. Oh yeah, action yeah. sequence. Yeah, I mean, really like I said, that 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 thing probably took thirty seconds um, or forty five seconds. But you know, on film, you can with slow motion and multiple angles and just that and matte painting. And yeah, you can extend it. I was going to say the style of something of Highlander is something that's pretty amazing to us because it's this cool mashup, it would seem, of film noir. There's swashbuckling elements uh, that are very theatrical. There's romance. There's history. Um, you know, were there any particular films or scenes in films that you were inspired by that you were like, I want to create like a noir fil- uh, aesthetic around Connor or around New York? Or uh, can you just talk about your inspiration for your visuals? Well, I think a lot of it was... Um especially some of those strange, the Fords, some of the action scenes. I used to love like 30s and 40s films with the, again with their dramatic skies and the wind and... <laughs> yeah, I've just found that very exciting. But that was, that, was, that was a great thing about the script was that it was this lovely, wonderful, uh, combination and marriage of um, fantasy and action and romance um, and life. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was just a you know, magic, magic script. So um, a lot of it, I can't think of anything too specific about influences. Um, the story itself just influenced me and my love of movies. And uh, I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are, nods i sort of wanted to have it sort of have two fields one sort of based in reality the new york stuff but the scottish stuff i wanted to to be romantic and theatrical we've talked a few times about some of the the original script and one one thing that's always kind of tantalized highlander fans is there's kind of these this mythical lost scene in the movie involving (laughs) This, this character, Young Dol Kim, and according to the internet, at least, the, the footage was destroyed in a fire and no one knows who this guy is. Do, do you remember this scene and, you know, kind of what... I, I, do, I, I, I do remember the scene, um, and I think it was a good scene. And, and, and I do remember we were editing it. Um, and so I, I don't think... Maybe the footage was lost after that, from what I remember. But from what I remember... Um, is that it was a good scene, but it was it just it, it just seemed to slow um, the story down because we had no real basis of who this character was. I mean, Christoph had no connection with him, um, and it just seemed to be like but a nice little action scene in the middle. Of, it was like going to a commercial. <laughs> it's like uh, okay, it just didn't it didn't gel. That makes sense. Yeah. You you wouldn't happen to even know the name no, of the it actor, is, it would is, you? It is, un, it is unusual that it's not on any um, extra features. Um, I've, I've seen one blurry photograph from, right. from behind the scenes of it. You, you've probably seen the same photograph, yeah? Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, so. exactly. The guy kind of looks like he's yeah. an airline pilot or a security guard or, right. or, or something. Yeah, and I think, he, I think he was sort of Middle Eastern or something like that. Yeah, but yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. Or security guard. Maybe a security guard. 
by by any chance yeah he, 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 yeah, he, yeah it, was all, it was all it was all set around computers so i think he was a security guard in some sort of computer office right and i think he gave up in the fight too that he just let the kurgan kill him which is like an, That's, an exciting oh God, interesting did, uh, uh, yeah i'm remembering that he did you're right he actually falls to his knees and what does, does something and sacrifices him so i'm not quite sure why but <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's one of the reasons the team was dropped because I'm, everyone's going like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a bold move to not understand why this character is committing suicide, basically. Yeah, or why this? Yeah, and, and why is this scene in the movie in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the the mystery remains unsolved for the moment. Sometimes it's good to have an I mean, unsolved listen, mystery. I mean, it's it's, it's, lucky, it's lucky that um, um, more than only that one's the one that sort of bit the dust because I remember in the in the American preview when we previewed it, um, a lot of execs were going, Oh, maybe we should get, lose the scene in France when they're the the jewel scene when he's drunk. Mm-hmm. Um I said, I don't know, do we need that sort of set that humor? I was like, oh. anyway, um but luckily the 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 computer uh, security guy is the only scene that seems to have been really lost of any version. One of the interesting uh, legacies of Highlander is a lot of people, I don't know if you're aware of this, have written about Highlander that it's, uh, you know, that it has all these other meanings to it. Uh, like, are there any uh-huh. meanings that you you think, like, uh, that people should, I shouldn't say should read into the movie, but, like, that the film can be appreciated in different ways? Like, are there any through lines that you that you see this movie as? It's a battle between good and evil or something else? Or Yeah, it, it is bad. It's um, uh, the value of life. I, I did read something. Someone was saying that um, there's been there's been discussion of being a, a, a gay allegory. Uh, well, I guess the so so some of the things we, we've read and we've tried to look at the film that way as well to to see if there's you know uh, any extra meaning. But some do, some of some of our listeners do, have do actually fill, do fill me. Do oh fill sure. Me in. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, some of our listeners have written in and like they've commented that this film seems to parallel some uh, elements of the you know gay experience in America and that you know Connor is someone who is ostracized for being born the way he is that you know he can't you know uh, Ramirez tells him he can't take a wife that he should leave her that people will fear them oh, wow. for okay. that they're different. Uh, and yeah, I, I remember the first time I I read that uh, interpretation. It kind of blew me away, and I was like, "Wow, this is such an interesting way that Highlander right. can I've live on." That, but that, that, yeah, I've never heard that. But that is, um, yeah, that I can see, I can see that. Uh, I don't, that was not the intention it made, but I can definitely uh, understand that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Less less interesting analysis of it is kind of a Cold War kind of alleg- allegory where you have this kind of Eastern European villain and, uh, you know, in the 80s where it's this literal apocalyptic battle between these forces. Yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> we recently uh, lost a, a major part of, of what made this movie go, which is Sean Connery. Uh, right. Do you have any particular, I, I understand that Sean Connery was only on the the set for a very limited amount of time. Was there a seven days? Seven days. Was there a plan on how to deal with it? Do you have any like key memories of yeah. working with yeah, Sean? Yeah, there Connery? was. And basically, the philosophy of filming Sean was uh, all cameras on Sean, uh, and that means um, shooting over Christoph's back to Sean, and then coming back three weeks later and shooting over a stunt double to Christoph. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, when you when you have someone like that, it's so important, but also for such a short time, and that's such a major role. Uh, yeah, all cameras on Sean to the point where on the last day of filming with him, I think it was the last like ten minutes or something, or half an hour, and he turned to me and said, "You know, I don't think you're going to finish with me. <laughs> and if you don't, if you don't, you know, I get a lot a lot of money for tomorrow." <laughs> and so. <laughs> We had th- we had three cameras and I had like some different hats and whatever hanging around and um, so I said okay roll and I got him just to say turn smile raise your sword look shocked da 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 and these cameras are zooming in and shaking and whatever and we did that for like three minutes got lots of great sort of like reactions and things like cut in anywhere because anyway, basically he had one costume in the film so that was lucky. And just put a hat on, hat off, 
uh, and was like, do this, do that, do that, screaming, run, stand up, laugh, cry, look around, raise your sword. And, and then eventually I said, and cut, and Sean Connery, that's the rap. <laughs> and he went, you busted. <laughs> In a, in, a, in, a, in, a loving, in a in a loving way, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, good, a, a brilliant, a brilliant guy. Just, a, I mean, one, a, one of, you know, just a unique, fabulous, wonderful man. He actually ended up coming back for you know. I think a lot of Highlander fans were surprised to, to see him come back again in Highlander too. Uh, yeah, weren't we all? Revolting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was, do you know how that decision actually came about? Or did you have any input uh, in how that was handled? Uh, I I don't know. I mean, it's best not to talk about number two. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so is that is Highlander two like a, a a thing that legitimately you don't like to rem to think about, or are there things that were sure. you know positive, yes. or are there things you wish no. people would look at positively from it, or just forget it? <laughs> no, it's for, yeah. move on. Enough of this useless banter. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> we all had those demons in our closet, yeah? <laughs> True enough. Well, we've heard that, uh, you know, thir even 35 years on, people, you know, had a lot of fun filming Highlander, that there were, you know, some, we've heard some crazy stories about what people got into. Do you have, like, a, a, a favorite crazy memory from the filming of that first Highlander movie? The church scene. I was amazed we got permission to film in this church, but they, I think the church was going broke and they needed some money. So they let us do that scene. And the scene is like totally sacrilege, like really <laughs> over the top. And uh, they just turned a blind eye to it while we filmed. And, uh, but uh, I, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, and, and Clancy, God bless him, just comes, just shines, shines a dark light so well in that scene. <laughs> Yeah, we but I mean, there were many, many surprises. And I mean, for example, even there's a scene when Christoph, when Nash comes to Brenda's apartment and uh, brings a bottle of wine. In that scene, he, he opens the wine and before they toast, he sniffs it. He closes his eyes, he sniffs, sniffs the wine and he said, he remembers back in, you go, 17, well, I don't know, what's a, a great year. Da -da -da, this happened, da -da -da, whatever happened. Brandy. Bottled in 1783. Wow, that's old. 1783 was a very good year. Mozart wrote his great mass. The Montgolfier brothers went up in their first balloon. <laughs> And England recognized the independence of the United States. Is that right? Yes. And he recited stuff and she's like, what the hell? And that particular sniffing was based on a friendship I had, uh, a guy called Jim Steinman, who uh, wrote and produced things like Total Look Into the Heart. And uh, yeah, things like that. Bad Out of Hell. Um, yeah, oh, Total Clips of the Heart's a great video of yours as well. That's great. Yes, okay. So so Jim Simon, producer of that, uh, he did the same thing. Well, I went out to Amsterdam with him, and he got this very old wine, this 1950s wine or whatever. He pulled the cork, and he stuck his nose and went, <laughs> and sniffed. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm actually breathing the air from 1945. And he closed his eyes, and I'm just, he just said, give me a moment. And he had the air of 1945 in his lungs. <laughs> And he said he takes him there. So I had Chris, and I remembered that. And so when we did that scene, I explained to Chris, like, you're, when you smell this wine, go back in your mind to the, the year that this wine was made, which is in the 40s. And uh, you were living in the 40s, and you were living in 1840, and you were living in whatever. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that worked so well. And thank you to the late and rest in peace, Jim Simon. I, I kind of love that as a visual, or the, the phrase like you're breathing air from insert year here. Like that's- Yeah, isn't it cool? Isn't it yeah, cool? Yeah, that's 
a incredible phrase and that's there's something so highlander about that it's like this interesting yes. capsule yes most, most, most of us can't do that because we can't afford wine that old to <laughs> <laughs> yeah how was that wine oh well from like three years ago oh, great that's what i'll do i'll crack this ah two, 2017 was a very good year that's right <laughs> <laughs> but uh so do you have you know we, we've talked a, a lot about highlander obviously your music video catalog is perhaps what you are best known for for the the people at home who maybe know you more because of highlander than because of that aspect of your career is there like your top three that you think that like ah these are the ones that nailed it these are the ones people should see Cinematically, I, I love uh, Ultravox uh, Vienna. Nice. Um, but then there were two videos, uh, maybe not my, not my favorite, but I mean, the two videos uh, that were important as far as film career goes is um, Duran Duran, and they're, and they're both Duran Duran videos. Um, one's Hungry Like a Wolf. And it was upon that the producer Hal McElroy rang me up in London and said, I've just seen the video. Do you want to come and do a movie? And I went, oh, yes, of course I do. <laughs> and I said, then what's, what, what, what is it about? And he said, it's about a giant killer pig. And I went, excellent. Um, <laughs> and, so, and then the second video was The Wild Boys, again, Duran Duran. And we did The Wild Boys, which was based on, the lyrics were based on a novel that I had the rights to at the time, uh, William Burroughs' book, The Wild Boys, by William Burroughs. Hmm. And... Um, Simon Le Bon said, you know, can I write a, can I write a song called The Wild Boys? Can I commit, you know, can you give me the permission? I said, yes, you have permission. As long as I can do visuals that I want to do, because I want to do the movie, The Wild Boys. Anyway, so we, we, we shot the video, a wonderful, um, wonderful time we had on that, uh, with Simon strapped to a windmill. Um, and and, and upon, upon that video, EMI saw that and said, do you want to do a film called Highlander? Uh, so the, the music videos, not only were, were my film school, they're also uh, a gateway to my ultimate goal was to make you know, uh, movies and TV. Awesome. And do you, I think, uh, you know, looking back through your videos, our listeners would, uh, you know, if they haven't seen a lot of them before, they'd be really, I think, surprised at the influences they can see that made their way into Highlander or The Shadow or any of your other projects. Uh, you know, I, there's uh, one of my favorite videos you did is the Thin Wall, uh, Ultravox. Um, All right, yeah. But partially probably because I do love, you know, those that noir element and the lighting's great. And uh, I don't know, every every bit yeah, of that uh, yeah. video has like something interesting yeah. we, to look we, at, which is great. We did some, I did some few videos with, um, I did uh, The Voice and also the first video I did with uh, Ultravox was a thing called Passing Strangers. And the unusual thing about that video is that it shot at a place called Beckton Gasworks in uh, East London. Incredible sort of apocalyptic, resiny, sort of like uh, exploded landscape. It's an old gasworks, but it's all decaying and falling apart. And it's just acres and acres of these structures, which... And then many, a number of years later, Kubrick moved in and used it for full metal jacket. And that's the whole second half of the film when they're all wandering around Vietnam, but it's actually packed in gas works with some planted palm trees. Um, oh, wow. And that's pulled, it's been pulled down now and now it's a glorious Olympic park and whatever. But it was one of my favorite, and I tried Boy George video there, War Song, a number of videos I tried packed in gas works. It's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite locations. Awesome. Now gone. But, it, but, it, but immortalized by a few of my videos and also Kubrick's full metal jacket. It's it's so interesting to see the the reach of that. <laughs> That's so cool. But you know, you know, I've been a, been a great, been a huge Kubrick fan. I was also really chuffed that our camera operator on Highlander was a guy called Dougie Milson, who then uh, was the operator on and lighting and lighting DOP on The Shining, and also then moved on and became the the DOP the director of photography on Full Metal Jacket. So I was always talking about Kubrick with him and because I'm such a huge fan. Uh, but there was one point, there was one time when Kubrick was filming 
I was still I was doing a pickup with a Luma, I needed a Luma crane for pickup for for Highlander, and the Kubrick was needed it for he 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 had it, uh, but he had the operator sitting at home with the crane at home, um, because Kubrick didn't know whether he wanted to use it or not, and he wouldn't let me have it, but I still <laughs> I still loved Kubrick. I I didn't hold it against him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you've mentioned a few uh, behind the scenes people here or a few people who are, who are perhaps not connected with the film that inspired some key visuals in it. Are there any uh, kind of unsung heroes from this project in your mind? You know, people who uh, fans might not know about, but who actually contributed something, who contributed something really significant and iconic to the movie? The Scots, um, they, when we're up there in the Glencoe and we were doing the battle scenes, it was freezing cold. And these guys were in kilts and standing in mud. And we're all got fucking jackets on and this and that and drinking hot cocoa. <laughs> and see, these guys all sort of laugh. And they're, they're totally crazy. And um, we just, they give them a, like a nip of scotch, you know, just to warm them up and get them ready. And uh, then they'd say, Kill the Englishman! <laughs> and I sort of raised my flag. So I, I'm Australian, so I'm <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> uh, but that was that was just wonderful. They never they never complained. You know, they just never they just got in there and just did it and just just wonderful, wonderful people and uh, just had a great great time. Um, yeah, but you know, uh, one of the other great great moments of of this. Uh, the film was again in post-production, and it's when we brought brought Queen in to see a twenty minute twenty minutes of the film, a few scenes, like a number of scenes, about twenty minutes of the film. And they went to the theatre, and we sat outside like fighting our nails, and we thought they were going to do, give us hopefully hopefully give us a song, and uh, they came out and they went, wow, okay, we're going to each write a song. So we got like what? We got like four four songs. What? It's pretty amazing. You know, we had Freddie run and Roger Roger Taylor wrote one. Brian May wrote obviously um, Who Wants to Live Forever. Just wonderful classic songs. Uh, that was that day when they said we're all going to write a song for you because we love this. Uh, it's like really, damn. <laughs> How did the addition of the 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 new the additional queen music affects kind of your editing process in post and how it all came together. Well, luckily, luckily Michael Kamen, the composer of the music for the film, was an old rock and roller also. So he, he could buy, he would like say do the fight scenes and uh, the, what say in the, in the car park, and, uh, I wanted it very abstract and strange and he was all cooking along with that. But then when Queen would do a, a song, he would turn his orchestration and become their music, and then the song would take over, and then he would take over with the orchestration. And it became this incredible marriage of two different uh, musicians, like Queen and Michael Kamen, two, two different entities, but they just joined in the middle and, and became this seamless moment where you had traditional orchestration going into sort of rock and roll, and then reprising that rock and roll in an orchestral way. It was magic. As the song goes, it was kind of, it was kind of magic. Legacy of Highlander lives on, and you know, uh, it's your films. Honestly, have been something that we we grow up grew up watching. Uh, you know, it's it's been a mainstay in our our lives for a long time. And so now it's this many years later. How do you feel about that? The idea that they're rebooting Highlander um, has has anyone well, actually yeah, contacted I mean, I mean, you and said like, hey, what would your input you, be? I I know the people very well. I mean, I know uh, the people at Lionsgate and all that, and 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 God bless them and. Uh, it's all it's very exciting. I mean, uh, but I, I've been hearing about a reboot for the last what twenty years, <laughs> right? <laughs> and a new one pops up every three years. It's like, uh, you know, this guy's going to do it. Oh, this guy. Oh, great. Oh, wow, this is good. Um, I think we nailed the script. And, and basically, yeah, it's going to be a reboot. It's not going to be 
a different story. Apparently, the story is going to be the same ish story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's a great idea. It's, it's, I, I think excellent. I really, really, really wish them the best with it. You know, unfortunately, one of the one of the people really pushy it was one of the producers, Peter Davis, uh, who recently passed away. Um, so that may put a little sort of pause on it. But I think I think I think eventually it will happen. Yeah, I, I think, think so too. Uh, yeah, I, I really do. I really look forward to seeing it. That's great. Yeah. Is there anything about the reboot that you hope when they they do make the movie that you say that like I hope they don't change this one thing that I contributed? Is there something that you no. want them to carry forward, or if they change no, it all no, up, I you're think, totally ab- cool? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, they should not have the a ball and chain around their around their, their feet or neck. Just uh, go and do it. Be fresh and be new, and just uh, it's a great story and, and tell it in a different way. Both both can coexist. Definitely, right. You know, one question we, we always have to ask people because it's so central to, to Highlander itself is, if given the option, would you want to be immortal? Uh, no. Ooh, why not? I think life, life is good. And I'd have to know where it's going. I mean, I think being immortal would be just, I think you would waste a lot of time. There'd be no sort of, desire to go do something because you say oh, I can do that in 10 years or 100 years right um, so I think there'd be a lot of sitting around <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know yeah, it's a yeah. More extreme. I, I guess if you're immortal you can't die so therefore you could probably eat a lot of, a lot of fried chicken <laughs> that's right that would be a big benefit and and all, all that really all that really tasty bad stuff you know I was questioning whether I'm really immortal but you're changing my mind if I've got like a little yeah. on the on the table, I might go. For it. Yeah. Just sit around eating, eating burgers all day, going, "Oh fuck, it. I'm, just, I'm not going to die." Um, <laughs> and then what do you do? Do you decide to walk across the United States because you've got time? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it get really boring. Yeah, I can see that. I don't know. When I have a free weekend, I tend to to waste my time too, and I I can only imagine Although how much time you, I'd waste. Being immortal doesn't mean you've got an immortal bank account either. <laughs> so does that mean you've got to like work for the rest of time? Yeah, I mean, if that one guy was supposed so to be- you pay, So you can pay your rent? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like- nah, forget it. Definitely. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Russell, for for joining us today. This was really a treat to have you on the show. Uh, again, Highlander is well, one of been, our favorite films. It's been a pleasure, Keith and Kyle. It's um, been a lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, yeah, we, we can't wait to see you know uh, what you're up to next, and uh, you know you will see. In the meantime, we'll always be enjoying your films, uh, so and videos. So. Well, thank you, sirs. Appreciate uh, it. Very good. Thank you so much, Thanks. Russell. So much. This have, was have a good one. All right. <laughs> All Bye-bye. right. See ya. See Bye. Soon. Thanks. Thanks so much. That was awesome. We got to just talk to Russell Mulcahy. Uh, I'm flipping out. It was great. What'd you think, Kyle? Dude's a legend. Uh, <laughs> there were some interesting stories. I am obsessed with that story about the wine cork. Oh, and how that came. That's up. perfect. That's like that. That might be. I, and I don't know that that's ever been. I've never heard that story told anywhere before. Um, so that's super cool. I I can see th- the concept of someone doing that in real life. And saying it and like it landing is kind of amazing to me. It's awesome. Also, in a in another film, I mean, I don't know. You think of action adventure movies or or just whatever today. Like, ask yourself: Is there a scene when the the hero, like the hero of the swashbuckling adventure, like smells wine and like things get real quiet and like introspective? Like the fact that that scene's in the movie, I think, like helps a lot. Like, make the the Highlander universe seem so much more lived in and real and like it's it's a cool like thought experiment for the audience even even to like be like whoa like i haven't been confronted with this idea that like when i open up a bottle of wine at home like i get to travel through time too if i want which is cool yeah super cool uh you know i i hope people are more excited to check out some of the catalog of uh his music videos in anticipation of this we checked out some of keith i know we checked out some of these ultravox ones they are super cool seeing some of the visual cues between this and his movies was was really interesting 
yeah, uh, it's it's worth uh, checking all of Russell's videos out. Also, because he worked with so many like legendary musicians. Uh, I mean, from Elton John to Billy Joel, the Buggles. Who else? Uh, it goes. You're just filling me with regret that we didn't ask about all that. But I know there's I, there's only so much time. Uh, yeah. With a limited amount of time, Spando well, Ballet, one of my favorite groups. Ah, there's a there's a lot of great music videos uh, that Russell directed. Also, I think we should all be appreciative. Like Russell, like invented the music video in a way uh, that that language we see with the editing and the the angles and the you know uh, composition of shots and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so I don't know. Russell's had his hand in a lot of big uh, iconic things uh, from music videos to like. The language of Highlander, which is pretty rad. Uh, so I'm really glad we got to talk to him a bit about it. It was cool. Outstanding. Well, please tell us your thoughts, people at home. This was a, a rare treat. Let us know what you thought of, of these tidbits, this Highlander and music video knowledge that you've gained. Tell us all about it. We want to hear it. Yeah, you can write us at highlanderrewatched at gmail.com. Uh, keep those uh, emails about Young Dong Kill, kill Young Dong Young dog him to a minimum uh because once again we get confirmation that this footage seems to be lost like everyone is always clamoring like where's the footage exist i don't know who knows but it's good to have a mystery i think uh that's the the highlander mystery that can live on which is cool yes in the hearts and minds everywhere <laughs> but until then we've been your rewatchers i'm keith this is kyle and Bye. Amen. Oh, Bye. <laughs> whatever. Bye, Eamon. Yeah, he's Bye, not here. Eamon. Sorry, Eamon. Bye. Bye. Definitely. Welcome to a very special special. <laughs> I said special. I'm not stopping this time. This is Kyle, and it's just the two of us here bringing you one of our most special Highlander episodes to date. That's right. We have a very special go. Special! I keep saying special. <laughs> I can't even see you because I got my notes in front of the thing. Okay, here we go. Oh. Uh.